Today we are going to talk about the urinary tract stones in rural areas and how we can manage them. These full lectures are available in a different link. This is part of the lectures which are given by the International Federation of Rural Surgeons. And uh, they were initially Zoom lectures, which were telecast by Lab Guru and other places. So if we look at the historical evidence, the stone disease is a very common one. It has been found uh, even in the Egyptian mummies. And in India, Shushrutha has supposedly performed surgeries for stone disease in the 12th century. So it's a disease which has been there for a very, very long time. The first open surgery for stone disease was uh, performed in 1879. And the open surgeries have been there for a very, very long time. And the first new thing which happened was in uh, Europe in the 70s, when they found out how to do PCNL, or percutaneous uh, drilling of the kidney and removing the stone. And then it was the Dornier Aircraft Company, which uh, devised the equipment called the ESWL, or extracorporeal shockwave therapy. These two things are possible because uh, stones are hard and brittle, and they do not have the elasticity of the rest of the tissues. So it's possible to break them using uh, shockwaves, either extracorporeal as in ESWL, or with the lithotripsy during PCNL. And now coming back to the incidence of uh, stone, it's a very common problem, as he said, it's been there for thousands of years. And 12% uh, of men will have a stone formation sometime during their life. So which is uh, quite a high, if you consider the population of the world. One tenth of them will have stone sometime or other in their life. And it is a little more common in uh, men compared to women. And once somebody has a stone, is a very high chance of recurrence. Or half of them would recur within five or 10 years. And in many places, one tenth of any hospital I mean, admission is due to kidney stones. And the particular problem is that uh, the incidence in highest during the most uh, productive period of anyone's life, which is about uh, 30 to 45 years. And how do these uh, stones present? Most of us would have heard of the classical renal colic, which is a very severe pain, colicky pain present in the groin, which radiates down to the groin. And uh, can last for about 15 minutes to half an hour and makes a patient keep rolling in pain. But then uh, this classic symptom is uh, not very common. Most of the time they are incidental findings. And again, uh, hematuria, which can be either gross or macroscopic or microscopic. These two are very I mean, dramatic symptoms, but they are not very common. However, lower urine tract symptoms like uh, dysuria, increased frequency, nocturia, and these sort of symptoms are fairly more common than these uh, dramatic classic symptoms. But most of the time, it is the incidental finding when you're evaluating for some other thing or uh, urinary tract infection or even uh, renal impairment. And what about in India? In India also, they say about uh, one out of every thousand people have the stone disease. And some areas are shown in the map. The incidence is uh, very high. And these are called the stone, stone belts. Maharashtra, Gujarat, Punjab, Haryana, Delhi, and Rajasthan. And uh, the reason is that uh, these are humid places and people sweat quite a bit. And then several studies have shown that uh, they 
people in these areas they pass only about one to one and a half liters of urine in a day which is adequate for renal function but then inadequate to prevent stones there are also several large studies to show that if someone passes about three and a half to four liters of urine in a day the problems associated with the stones are not there even if they form stones they will pass it away when the stones are very small and uh, why is this important the amount of uh, urine that they pass it's because uh, most of the solids or proteins which are found in urine are in uh, what is called super saturated uh, solution in other words uh, normally if uh, 10 grams would uh, dissolve in uh, water and uh, if we have 12 grams then we'll start precipitating but then urine is such that uh, almost 20 25 grams can be present dissolved in urine and it's a very very delicate balance so anything which uh, disturbs this balance it will form stones so as expected uh, most of the stone formers are idiopathic stone formers or in other words nobody really knows what is the cause of the or the reason for the stones to form but then a variety of theories have been described but most of them ultimately will lead to the fact that the people who get stones are those who drink less water and of course there are some instances maybe 3 to 5% where there are metabolic abnormalities which contribute to stone formation and these are suspected if the stones are bilateral recurrent or occur in a younger age group and multiple stones are there so what happens to these stones most of the stones especially if you are drinking enough water and passing sufficient urine would uh, pass off but then some of them can uh, act as an idus over which uh, further particles uh, deposit and it starts growing and some of them can grow as big as to, to cover the entire kidney and are called stagon calculus and they can get blocked in various places as shown here like uh, and the uh, ureter comes out of the kidney it's constricted by the renal fascia then the ureter passes above the iliac artery then at the ureter vesicle junction there is narrowing these are places where these nidus or small stones can get stuck and uh, further deposits over a nidus will make them uh, present as larger stones and uh, what are the common types of stones there is struvite stone cysteine stones uric acid stones calcium stones it doesn't really help to know what exactly caused it because uh, treatment is almost the same for whatever type only thing to remember about the type is that the uric acid stones are radiolucent so in a normal kub x ray you might not be able to see these uh, uric acid stones so as we mentioned briefly earlier the most common presentation is that they are incidental findings if they come up uh, do for some other reason uh, x ray or ultrasound you'll find a stone or a very dull aching pain which is non specific can be another common presentation and the classical uh, symptoms of uh, renal colic or hematuria are fairly rare and then urinary tract infection is uh, some uh, one with screening test that we do because uh, if there are blood in the urine or pustules in the urine then we would like to investigate them further and then any mild uh, urinary tract symptoms also warrants uh, what are the common investigation that we do in a rural area urine microscopy is a basic easily available uh, investigation if there are stones especially if they have sharp edges and there is some inf infection or inflammation there are bound to be some red blood cells in the urine 
and if there's infection, some white blood cells. And then if there are <coughs> if there is infection, we would also like to know what are the bacteria which causes the infection. So you need to do a urine culture and sensitivity to give the appropriate antibiotic. Most of the time with the experience, just a plain KUB would suffice. But again, many parts of the country might not have a facility for X-ray. In that case, ultrasound would be able to pick up these stones. But the problem with ultrasound is that it will not uh, tell you or oh, it can't pick up the stones in the ureter unless there is a block and some amount of urine above it. And then, of course, the other tests we do are the routine tests that are necessary for any surgical procedure. Intravenous urography is one test which is uh, used quite a bit earlier. But now we'll, I mean, if you are able to pick up the stones clearly in a KB X-ray, you might not need it unless you're suspecting on uh, both sides. Because IVU gives a little bit of information about the functioning of the kidney. So if there are stones in both the sides, you need to make sure that both the kidneys are functioning before you take a decision of how to treat it. And if the stones are bilateral or uh, multiple or occur in a younger age group, then these investigations are warranted, like uh, serum calcium, phosphorus, uric acid, and these may be normal and 24-hour uh, urine calcium and uric acid and so on uh, can be positive. And sometimes uh, whatever stones that you remove could be sent for analysis. But then uh, it might not uh, help too much in uh, treating these conditions. And when do you need immediate treatment? If there is any obstruction or these obstruction, uh, the stones are bilateral and there is... Uh, deterioration of renal function, or if there is a refractory pyelonephritis, or unremitting pain, or stone in an infected kidney. All these are conditions that uh, you want to treat immediately and uh, by whatever means that you have to remove the stones to make the patient all right. But otherwise, uh, most of the stones can initially have a period of conservative treatment. What is this uh, conservative treatment? If there are stones up to about 12 millimeters in size, they can pass by themselves. The treatment consists of uh, antibiotic to control infection, because we said uh, the many of the stones are infected and infection can cause some inflammation and uh, edema. So when the antibiotic is given an inflammation uh, and infection settles down, then uh, there are more chance of the stone to pass. Then he gives some analgesic if the patient has pain. And then one of the specific medicine that we give is the alpha blockers or tamsulosin. This makes the ureter dilate. It's a smooth muscle relaxant which makes the ureter dilate. And this again helps in... Uh, moment of the stone and then uh, give uh, hydrotherapy because we said uh, the primary reason why they form these stones is that uh, they don't drink enough water so you should give enough uh, water to make them pass at least three and a half four liters of urine in a day and iv fluids are given if the patient cannot uh, take orally that much uh, water and what are the other treatment options ESWL is the, I mean, initially devised by the Dornier Aircraft Company. This uh, sends a series of shock waves which are focused onto the stone from outside. And they can break the stones. Then we have a unitary endoscopy that we use very frequently. We'll discuss a little later. And then the PCNL which came about in the 70s and the open surgeries which have been there for hundreds of years. And uh, what does this uh, ESW will do? It uh, is the ideal treatment for stones between 1.5 centimeter and two centimeter size, especially if they're in the 
upper uretric uh, region or the upper calyces. And the reason is that uh, it's a painless treatment and uh, there's no admission or anything involved. And some people, if, especially if the stones are larger, might uh, require DJ stenting and some medicines to make them pass uh, more urine and uh, maybe tamsulosin. But the only disadvantage is that it's a very expensive equipment. Many of the rural, I mean, not rural, many of the urban centers also can't afford it because it's very, very expensive, almost as expensive as the aircraft. And then the next minimally invasive treatment is the PCNL. So here there is a nephroscope which is used and uh, the, instrument, the instrument is passed through the calyces. Sometimes you might uh, need one or two punctures to puncture the calyces and go in and under vision break the stones. But this again is a complex procedure because first you need to pass an open-ended catheter, then you need to keep injecting contrast, change the position, puncture the needle, put in a guide wire, dilate the track, and then finally use the nephroscope. And uh, because the kidney is uh, punctured, there is always going to be a chance of bleeding and uh, complications, which can occur a couple of days uh, later also. And sometimes, uh, or quite often, we need to leave behind a double J stent in PCNL also. But the advantage is that uh, in one sitting, the entire stone can be removed. Again, what about the open surgeries? This, the several techniques have been described for over the years because the surgery started uh, hundreds of years ago. And here also is difficult because uh, you need a very large incision. You need to sometimes uh, for a proper exposure, remove part of the rib. And again, uh, just like PCNL, if we had to make an incision in the kidney, then the chances of hemorrhage are high, especially secondary hemorrhage. So it's not uh, very advisable to do them in rural areas because uh, one week or two weeks later, you can have uh, severe bleeding and uh, the local people are not able to handle it. Patients can die. So what uh, we used to do is, uh, we used to try and uh, remove all the stones only through the renal pelvis instead of uh, opening the kidney. So we combine both uh, open and endoscopic techniques. We pass the cystoscope or ultrarenoscope from the pelvis. Because sometimes uh, if it's an extra renal pelvis, it's easy to remove the stone. But uh, intrarenal pelvis, uh, the pelvis size is small. So then you need to use the scope to fragment and remove the stones. Especially in rural areas, it's important to remember that unnecessarily opening the kidney or the I mean, making incision in the kidney can be dangerous. So now we categorize the stones into various types. What do we do for small stones? If the stones are less than five millimeters in size, almost 98% of them will pass by itself. And uh, generally, only thing we do is advise them to drink sufficient water. But if they are up to about seven millimeters, then we can try the medical exponential therapy. So that is, you give them a lot of uh, fluids, maybe a small diuretic to make them pass a lot of urine, tamsulosin to dilate the ureter. And then uh, they might pass it. And what about stones which are from seven millimeters to 12 millimeters? Here, just a, uh, DJ stenting should be sufficient. You can add the medical expansion therapy along with it. And most of them up to 12 millimeters will pass if you give them about six weeks to two months time and they drink a lot of water. Even if they don't pass, you can do a ureterinoscopy to remove the stone. And then this is the most common stones that you'll inquire, the medium-sized stones. 
So here what we do is as a first stage, we put in a DG stent. This makes a ureter dilate to about two and a half to three times the original size. So normally it's a closed tube. It's only the peristalsis which opens the ureter and uh, makes the urine come down. But uh, once you have a stent, the ureter dilates, the inflammation settles down, the infection settles down. So all these things make it uh, comfortable to do a ureter endoscopy six weeks later. Generally, when the ureterinoscope was uh, invented, it is meant to be used only for the lower third uh, ureteric stones. But uh, you'll also notice when you're doing a DJ stent, the guide wire uh, stent just about goes into the ureter. But if you wait for six weeks, the ureter dilates so that the ureterinoscope can comfortably go in. And then we can reach right up to the renal pelvis and the upper and middle calices. And uh, what about large stones? So if they have uh, centers where PCNL is possible, that may be the ideal one setting, you can remove all that. But if it's not possible, in, uh, if you don't have time, you can do open surgeries. But then if you have enough time, even for large stones, ureterinoscopic removal is possible. You put a stent, go in six weeks later, break some part of the stones, replace the stent, wait for another six weeks, then you can go in. This can be repeated several times. And this is um, almost uh, hardly any invasion in it or minimally invasive procedure because you go through the normal urinary passage and the patients uh, can be discharged the next day because uh, they need to wait only because you have a spinal anesthesia. So this is the technique that we have been using in rural areas for a long time. We have done over three to 5,000 surgeries like this, if you take uh, both left and right sides. And uh, the earlier the problem was that at the beginning, we were not able to remove stones which are in the lower calyx because the ureter endoscope is a rigid scope. So we are able to reach the upper calyx or middle calyx. But then uh, later on, we devised things like uh, tilting the patient, having the patient head down, and uh, flushing maneuvers and uh, various other techniques with which about uh, two-thirds of the calyxal stones also we were able to remove. We used to alternate uh, suction and flushing and uh, various methods are possible. But these are in areas where it is possible, I mean, only spinal anesthesia is possible and uh, patients are available frequently to come again and again for treatment. And it's also important to give prophylactic antibiotics. As you mentioned earlier, if culture reports are available, we can give the appropriate antibiotic. Otherwise, we give aminoglycoside and the third generation cephalosporin if you want a wider cover. But then uh, most important uh, instruction is what you give in the post-op period because you are just breaking the stone and leaving it. So the patient needs to drink enough water to flush away the various stone fragments. And again, uh, DG stent is a foreign body. We do not want to have it in the body for more than three months. So it is important to make sure that they come back for review. And in the x-ray, you can see what is called stain strasse or stone street. Because the broken fragments will come and block. So it is important to make sure that the stent stays inside. And if they don't drink enough water, the I mean, uh, stent can itself act as a nidus for further stone formation. And we also give uh, generally these medications, one bedtime dose antibiotic to prevent infection, then uh, alpha blocks like tamsulosin. We also like to alkalinize the urine. We give sodium bicarbonate tablets so that uh, these uh, the less precipitation. So in short uh, summary, the renal stones are possible for being treated in the rural area, especially if they are diagnosed early. 
So if the small stones, most of them will come out by itself if they drink sufficient water. Medium sized stones, just uh, DJ stenting should suffice, which any doctor, I mean any surgeon working in rural area can learn how to do. Even large stones by repeated uh, endoscopic uh, method, you can remove it. Thank you.